Well, folks, it's finally here, finally for me anyway, Unfreedom of the Press. And uh, this book took me a little over a year to write. We've talked on and on about the media. Everybody does. Talk at a superficial level. It's very liberal. It's undermining the president of the United States. What are we going to do about it? And then we move on to the next thing. I decided, like I have with all my books, to tackle this subject. What do we mean by freedom of the press? What do we mean by journalism? What do we mean about objective truth? What do we mean about all these things? Are there standards? Is journalism truly a profession? Do newsrooms truly seek out news? Well, it's a complicated answer. And yet the bottom line is that we have a media in this country that has lurched hard left. I call it the Democratic Party press. Many, many decades ago, we had a party press, newspapers aligning with one party or the other. We don't have that anymore. We effectively have 98% of the media out there aligning themselves with one party, the Democratic Party, and embracing the progressive ideology and pushing that agenda, a social activism media. That's very dangerous for a free republic. It undermines our constitutional system. It also destroys not just freedom of the press, but freedom of speech because they demand a uniform attitude, a uniform thinking process. I'll give you a perfect example. I'll meet the press a few months ago. Chuck Todd announced that no longer would they have guests who question man-made climate change. Now there are physicists, there are all kinds of people with PhDs, meteorologists, climatologists, experts who've written books, experts who run think tanks, and on and on and on, who say, wait a minute, there's some serious questions about so-called man-made climate change. But you won't hear from them on Meet the Press. You won't hear from them on NBC, because Chuck Todd is the chief political uh, newspaper or newsman for NBC. And so what's happening here is the agenda of the left, the progressive agenda, is being repackaged as news and being pushed out. The bigger problem is opinion is being repackaged as news. When you watch Don Lemon on CNN or Chris Cuomo, or you watch so many of the others on MSNBC, or even the major networks, or when you read a newspaper, you can't tell a lot of the time whether these are really news people or opinion makers. And the reason is, a lot of the time, they're not news people. They're opinion makers dressed up as journalists. This is destructive to the news. Survey after survey, poll after poll, underscores this point, that there is an ideological and political agenda and partisanship with so much of the so-called media in this country. And it undermines the country. Half of the country, that is, most Republicans, most conservatives, don't trust the media. Most Democrats and most liberals do. Well, what does that tell you? Most of the media live and work in and around Washington, D.C., New York, and some in Los Angeles. These are dark blue areas. Uh, so by geography as well as politics, there's a big middle part of the country, a lot of it's red, that they have no association with in their day-to-day -day activities and throughout much of their careers. Part of the problem also is that we're being fed propaganda we're being fed pseudo-events, pseudo-events. This whole collusion issue was a pseudo-event. It was, as the president says, and he's viscerally correct, fake news. And so the country is forced to focus on this pseudo-event of collusion for over two years because it is immediate obsession. Why is it immediate obsession? Because they're hoping it can be used to destroy the Trump presidency. Then you have pseudo-event built on pseudo-event. So you have collusion. Then you have obstruction. Then you have subpoenas. Then you have uh, lawsuits. Then you have 700 prose former prosecutors sending a letter. Then you have demands for impeachment. All pseudo-events, all manufactured in order to try and destroy the Trump presidency. I have a section in the book that talks about the New York Times. Why the New York Times? Because that's supposed to be the guide star of the modern media. But the guide star of the modern media really has a very dark past. During the Holocaust, during the Holocaust, when people were being round up, put on trains, sent to gas chambers, to ovens, mass executions, and so forth, the New York Times printed very, very little about that. It knew about it, but it printed very, very little about it. It ignored its sources. It decided it didn't want to be viewed as a niche Jewish newspaper, and it was concerned about that. It didn't want to offend the, the uh, 
the positions being put out by the Franklin Roosevelt administration, which said to downplay it, and there were a host of reasons. What kind of a business, let alone a media outlet, would conduct itself that way, and then today be treated as the great iconic newspaper, the New York Times, that everybody follows? And it wasn't just that. About 10 years earlier, when Stalin was wiping out the Ukrainians, 10 million of them, through starvation, the New York Times reporter on the scene, the senior correspondent, was Walter Durandi. Walter Durandi was in the back pocket of Stalin. Some people thought he was getting paid off because he lived very well, and he would be uh, driven around in these, in these black sedans, and nobody lived like that without Stalin knowing and Stalin helping. He covered up what was taking place in the Ukraine. Not only did he cover it up, when some journalists out of Britain actually went to the Ukraine and saw the cannibalism that was taking pace, place, the mass starvation. It was, it was unbelievable, they said. Walter Durandi would attack them in the news pages of the New York Times. And the managers and the executives of that newspaper had to know that Walter Durandi was being dishonest, it was deceiving the readership. They got a Pulitzer Prize for that. So I wanted the American people to know through unfreedom of the press about the New York Times. So there's an enormous amount that's covered in this book, but I did it a different way. It's perfectly understandable. It's perfectly digestible. One chapter can stand alone, but on the other hand, one leads to the other. My wife, Julie, likes to say it reads like a novel. Another gentleman told me yesterday that it's almost like a documentary. I hope you'll take the time to get it. You can go online at Amazon.com and purchase it. Every major retail outlet has it now. There's plenty of books out there. You'll want to get the first edition if you can because I'm sure there'll be additional printings. Unfreedom of the press. I didn't write it for the press. I wrote it for you. I hope you'll get your copy soon.